Leap of Faith podcast fans. Welcome to this week's episode with yours truly, Randy Silver. This week, I have one of my best friends in the whole world, Nate Redmond on. Nate, say hi to the fans for me. Hola, fans. Hola, fans. And the reason why Nate is on, because he epitomized Leap of Faith, the message of overcoming adversity, preparing yourself to conquer the world. And he conquered one of the seven wonders in mountain climbing recently. He just climbed the tallest mountain in the Western and Southern Hemisphere at 23,000 feet. That is 6,961 meters in Argentina called Mount Anconga. It took him 13 months of planning, training, and preparation for the challenge. Before uh, he was able to get to it, what does he need? He Nate. I know him very well, wasn't the biggest climber, like wasn't out there climbing mountains. So what did it take to mentally be able to climb mountains, physically, finding groups, preparation? And then, of course, we're going to dive into everything around climbing the mountain, some of the hard aches he saw, some of the challenges he overcame, and hitting the summit, as you can see in this picture right here, because, you know, as we do on YouTube, we have the immersive experience. So Nate has a bunch of photos we're going to talk about. Right now, we're looking at a photo of him, if you're on YouTube, of him at the summit. So... Let's talk about the mountains a little bit before we bring Nate in to give you lay of the land. The mountain is in the principal Cadilla of the Andres mountain range in Mendoza province, Argentina. The mountain is one of the seven summits. It's the highest peak on each of the seven continents. It's the second highest mountain after Mount Everest. The first known attempt to try to reach the mountain summit was made in 1883, but the attempt failed. In 1897, a Swiss mountaineer by the name Mathis Zubrian became the first climber to successfully reach the summit. Today, many climbers try to reach the summit via what is known as the normal route, which is a non-technical climb. A non-technical climb is one that can be achieved without using special skills or technology. However, because of the altitude of Akanuga, it is so extreme that a number of hikers have died from altitude sickness while trying to reach the summit, which is actually something Nate saw, and we're going to talk about that. So climbers also face other challenges, such as high winds, uh, frequent storms. And as you, of course, are you hitting such heights, you know, the mental, physical toll that goes with it. So when Nate came back, came way back to living in New York, I was like, Nate, I want to bring you on my podcast. I want to one personally hear about the climb and then get the share at the audience. So Nate, thank you so much for being here today. Let's bring you back in. Nate, welcome to the podcast. Awesome, Randy. Really appreciate uh, the time and having me on here after I got settled in. So I appreciate the leeway to get back to normal life after being in a tent for about three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so just for the audience, Nate and I have been best friends since college. Him and his twin brother, Eli, uh, you probably have seen some of them throughout the channel and videos and things like that on, on the YouTube channel. Uh, we, I met them as like basically two of my first friends in college. They were a year above me. We had math class together. I played lacrosse and they walked into class both in backwards hat, lacrosse pennies on. I was like, <laughs> these are my guys. So I went, I made a point to go introduce myself to them. And then it became love at first sight. And we've been best friends now. Wow, it's almost been like 10 years since that day. It's almost 10 years, yeah. Yeah, and we were just talking. <laughs> Shout out to Eli, his twin brother. Just got engaged to Monica earlier this week. So congratulations to Eli. We're so proud of you. Anything you want to say, Nate? Yeah, congrats, Eli. Proud it fully uh, fully came together. I know you were planning that for a long time, so I'm glad that uh, she said yeah. Yeah, that's surprise. new new sister in law. New sister in law. Nate's about to be an uncle soon. We'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> but to take it today, Nate. So you climb one of the tallest mountains in the world, top seven peaks, tallest mountain in the western and southern hemisphere. First off, before we kind of get into the climb and dive in the story, what made you want to make this such a feat? Yeah, that's a good question. Of course, a lot of people ask that question, like, why climb this mountain? It was about 13 months ago, maybe 12 months ago now, where my one of my colleagues who knows the guy who runs the company called Adventures Patagonicas, he said, I want to climb this mountain. And this was after a series of backpacking trips to Tahoe and, and really just loving the, the outdoors. I feel like I, I came from a place of team sports throughout college. Mm -hmm. And then after college, started a company with, with one of my good friends um, where I'm still at today. And then it kind of just plateaued on a, on a life challenge. And I felt like this was a really good challenge for myself to have a end goal in mind to keep striving towards something better than, than, uh, than what I am today. 
And so it's mainly just a, a self challenge where team sports wasn't cutting it. And I wanted to, to focus on, on something harder at life. Would you consider this a team activity because you're climbing with people or is it definitely more individual? Uh, I think it's more individual because all the lead up is really just training your ass off for something massive like this. And mm. you do climb with the group um, and there is some, some group camaraderie, but a lot of it is pushing yourself to the, to the limit. Got it. So how did you prepare yourself? What was that lead up time? So you said you had this idea <laughs> for about 13 months. Obviously, that's a lot of time to talk about. So some high level points. What did you do to prepare yourself? Yeah, it was tough. I mean, uh, most people to get prepared for altitude will go to altitude. Um, I didn't have the opportunity to do that. So a lot of it was at sea level in New mm -hmm. York or San Francisco. And then that combined with um, just a heavy pack, about 70 pounds was my was my top. And then started about 40 pounds and doing flights of stairs every single day. <laughs> Almost like fireman carries upstairs. Oh, yeah. So, and obviously in New York, there's a bunch of skyscrapers. So you had some stuff there. SF has it. So what would it be like the training when you say you're climbing stairs? Are you doing just like multiple miles a day, just up and down, up and down? Or would you take go up, take an elevator back down, go take go back up? What would that be like? That's a good question. So I am on the fifth floor in my apartment complex out of 15 floors. Um, I figured no one is really going to take the stairs above the fifth floor. And I really didn't want to run into anyone with a heavy, either weighted pack or like you and your, and your uh, workout videos, I the had weight a weighted vest, vest which yeah. was about 60 pounds. So what I would do is I would put on those boots that you see in the picture, which are like double or triple mountaineering boots for really low temperatures, <clears throat> put on my backpack or the weighted vest and then go from the fifth floor to the 15th floor and then just go back down and go back up. And I usually would do about a hundred to 140 flights of stairs in a given workout. Wow. Um, and either stick with that or go do like a six mile run just to increase my, my VO2 max to increase that oxygen saturation in my blood. And would you do the run with the weight on that would be after the workout? Um, so typically I wouldn't. So my, my left knee had a little bit of a, of a twinge in it. Um, there's like a, it was like a slight meniscus tear. So I would mm. stay away from a lot of high impact weighted runs like that. Got it. Did anybody ever see you on the stairs and be like, what are you doing? <laughs> so there was two times. Yeah. So, so one of the times, um, I had my high altitude mask, which restricts your breathing. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen those Bane masks at the gym? Yep. And then my weighted vest, my boots and everything. And this poor guy comes out, like just looking down at his phone. And I think I just scared the life out of him. <laughs> <laughs> Drops his phone down all the flights of stairs. You're like, that's not my fault. I apologize. Yep, exactly. Then what made you choose the mountain you chose of all the seven mountains that you could have? Yeah, so, so a lot of people, when they get into like high altitude climbing, they start with Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, uh, about like 19,300 feet, very, you know, not easy, but not, not super technical. And you're going through different tropospheres. So you're going from rainforest to rocks, to snow, to the summit. Um, <clears throat> but because my, my colleague knew the owner of this guided company and he wanted to go, I figured it would be nice to, to actually have someone else to, to pair up with and go with. And, yep. it, you know, it's a, it's, it's a huge feat. It's the second tallest yep. in the seven summits. So it's right below Everest. I mean, look at this view. So now we can kind of get transition to like, let's talk about the hike. But before we get into it, like, again, if you're listening on audio, we're looking at Nate at the top of the summit. You can just see the mountain ranges behind you, snow covered on it. Like, what was that peak feeling of when you hit the summit? And that was like, now from that point, we'll take it back to what it took to get there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so right behind your head was kind of our entry point. So we kind of scrambled right in between those two rocks. Um, and as soon as we got to the top, it's flat, which is, which is somewhat interesting. So this whole area was, was full with people. Um, we picked a really good weather window. And I'll talk more about how we got stuck at Camp 2 for a good five days trying to wait for this weather window. Um, 
I got to the top and, and just kind of started, started crying. Uh, there was just so much emotion behind getting to the top and preparation. I think I probably spent more time just looking at gear than it was my entire trip. Um, you know, figuring out what's the right gear, the weight of the gear. I actually made an entire spreadsheet on every single piece of gear that I owned that I was going to bring, how much it weighed, and calculated all of that at the bottom. Because every pound, every ounce, every gram counts when you're going at that altitude. That makes sense. Yeah, it, because you need to be able to, one, pack light. But also, like, if you're going to pack it, like, is it essential on me to have if I'm going to have to carry that weight <clears throat> up 20,000 feet? So this is where then we can change to a new picture and we can start the story. And this picture we were talking about beforehand is very iconic. So can you kind of talk about this picture? Because as you said, this was around the start of the trip and let the audience out there know what we're looking at. Yeah, so this was, this is basically working backwards. So this is on summit day, um, which was, you know, incredible just to start at, at 4 a.m. was the start of our climb. So this was actually the sunrise behind us that's casting a shadow from Aconcagua. Um, so this is probably like 6.30 a.m., so a couple hours into our, into our summit climb. And one of the people in our group started to like, you know, scream and yell because he was in the, in the back and we thought he was, he was like hurt or something was going wrong with him. And then we see this and it's just, you know, we, we had to stop and turn around and just look at this, this beautiful view. It's unreal. Like again, to, to, there's just a sunrise with shadows and you have the whole mountain range of the Andres and the Cascade and you can see people like over Nate's shoulder. There's a whole group of people coming up. There's a different group of people coming up over me. And Nate, you were saying at this point, this is where you actually saw people who didn't make it. So can you kind of talk about that? Um, what that was like to see in the moment and how you were able to say, you know what, I need to continue to persevere. Now let that deter you. Yeah, so in the beginning, it was it was still dark. We had our headlamps on. Um, we probably had every piece of clothing that I brought: puffy jacket, base layer, fleece, Gore-Tex, full down, you know, negative twenty degree jacket. Because it was it was probably about like negative ten when we started um, with with like fifteen to twenty mile an hour winds. Again, we we picked a really good weather window. And at first we were just chugging along. The very beginning is, is a very steep slope where you're sidestepping or, or toe pointing with your crampons and your double boots to, to get up the spot and really just huffing and puffing because you're at, you're starting at 20, about 20,000 feet. So you're, you have about 43% of the oxygen that you have at sea level. Yeah. Then we were passed by two rescue team members. And they were speaking Spanish to our guide. I didn't really hear what they were saying. Uh, and then we finally get to this point where we see them stopped with this other group of two, one person standing and one person, unfortunately, on the ground. Um, and that was 45 minutes into our summit bid of a, of a 16 hour day. And unfortunately, we got news, at, you know, a couple hours later that he didn't make it. Yeah. Um, and then surprisingly, after I got back down, I told, you know, my girlfriend and, and she actually found an article um, on, on this individual who unfortunately passed away. So there were, there were a few rescues throughout the entire trip. There were about three rescues, two successful and one unsuccessful. So it was, it was tough to, to see that in the beginning. And does that make you question, do I want to keep going? Or is it like, you know what, I'm prepared for this mentally, physically, I need to keep going. Yeah, that was, that was a tough part. There was actually one individual who, not in our group, but a, a, another American group who kind of hyperventilated and needed to, to go back down. But this was something, I mean, that's just, you know, how mountaineering is. There's always going to be something going wrong. So you have to prepare yourself mentally to get over those types of things. And this is what I, what I trained for. Um, you know, these types of big, big feats, big breaths, low oxygen. Um, and, uh, you know, he unfortunately couldn't... Uh, couldn't hang with the uh, the altitude. The group. And then what do you do? Like you said, you started at 4 a.m. It's like negative 10, 20 degrees. You're taking very deep, big breaths, hard to breathe. How do you wake up the body? Like as an athlete, you know, you do your stretches, you're warming up, you get loose. Like how do you get loose to be able to start a climb for 16 hours straight? Well, that's the interesting part too, because there's a certain times during this trip where you just don't sleep. Your body 
you know, at that altitude, your body does not want to sleep. Um, so there was no alarm needed. You, you just open your eyes and it's 3.45 a.m. And the amount of effort that it takes to just put on your clothes, that's basically your, your warm up. <laughs> as weird as it sounds, I mean, you, don't, you just don't want to stretch. Um, it, it just takes so much effort to do everything. Um, and it was actually uh, fairly cold that morning. So we had to put your mittens, your summit mittens, your boot liners, your socks, your gloves, your balaclava, which is the one that goes over your head and gives you that, that space for your goggles all into your sleeping bag or else it'll like frost up in the sleeping in the tent. So uh, I found that interesting. Almost every, every campsite we had to throw our stuff into our sleeping bag so it wouldn't freeze up. Interesting. And I guess also that would kind of act like the, the fact of blanket for you too, where you would be in the sleeping bag with you. So it kind of keep you a little bit warmer. Yeah. I have a lot more faith in, in, in sleeping bags. These negative 20 down sleeping bags surprisingly keeps you very warm as they should if, if i would hate for it to say negative 20 sleeping bag you know what it's actually not working <laughs> <laughs> sorry so then if we then if we can keep going back so that was kind of here so if we can take it to the beginning which is where you said you had your camp which was this picture we're going to pull up which is again in mm -hmm. the mountains uh more foggy here uh i think you said this was day two camp correct so this was camp two Camp two, excuse me. Um, so this was a uh, midway from from base camp to to the summit. In in the in the picture, we have his tent. There's some stuff around. So talk about this picture and what this picture represents and how we got to this point. Yep. So so this is camp two, and about eighteen thousand five hundred feet. Before this picture, like the day before, there was no snow on the ground up on the left side oh, and wow. on the entire floor. Uh, we, we hunkered down for a storm, which we stayed here for about five nights or so. Is it's hunkering just, down mean you just sit in your tent and you just let the storm pass through? Yeah. Sudoku, sit in the tent. And luckily our guides are amazing. So they brought food and, and soup and stuff to our tent. Um, so you can imagine like you're, you're stuck in your tent for, you know, five nights or so, maybe doing some some hikes just to keep the body warm um, and going to the bathroom. And that was not fun. <laughs> can only as, as you could imagine. I don't know if I want to go into detail, but basically like your, your hands are just like frozen um, by the time you're getting back in the tent. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, especially like, say you have to go number two, like just having to take a squat for a second. You're like, this probably is very painful. Yeah, you do have a nice toilet seat on like a five gallon bucket and with a bag. But other than that, you're you're exposed like the wind howling there was a time where I, you know altitude sickness gets a lot of people um you could be the most person in shape or you can be like a marathon runner it, it will affect you differently um mm -hmm. and so at this camp was when i experienced a little bit of altitude sickness where i was very close from turning around it was it was unbearable grueling um, i had to leave my tent like four or five times and like sit in like the 40 mile an hour winds where it was probably like like negative 20 with the wind chill and when you say and, what was out excuse me what was altitude sickness doing to you was it a, a mental thing or like you physically felt ill no it was both uh it was it was first uh my body um uh, headaches is typically how it starts and then nausea and then mentally i just wasn't sure if I could keep going from, cause we had to go to from camp two now to camp three and then camp three up to the summit. Um, so luckily I, I, you know, had a really good guide. He helped me. He actually gave me a, a mixture of this tea. It always comes down to the tea, right? They got the coca leaves, the ginger, the maca or whatever they put in there. And that actually helped tremendously. Um, but yeah, it was, it was tough. I almost turned around. Well, so what's it like when it's like the middle of a storm and you're in your tent and it's like day three and they're like, oh, we don't know when we can go. Like, yeah, you can only do Sudoku so many times. It's just like sharing stories, just scrolling through your phone. There obviously there's no Wi-Fi. So like things like that. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of would you, would you rather uh, 20 questions. So I got to know, I was with my colleague, Bill, uh, to, to climb. He unfortunately uh, experienced 
worse altitude sickness symptoms than I did here at Camp 2. There's something called periodic breathing at altitude, which means that your body thinks that it has enough oxygen. And this happens a lot when you're sleeping. Your body thinks that it has enough oxygen, so it stops breathing for between four seconds or 12 seconds at the, the worst. And then it says, okay, well, we actually have too much CO2. We need more oxygen. So take a deep breath in. Um, so you're basically waking up as if you're suffocating or like you're underwater, mm. um, which, which isn't fun. And so that was part of like the altitude sickness that, that both I had and my, my colleague Bill. So he had to go down. I had a new tent mate. His name was Tim from Colorado. Um, so we just, you know, played 20 questions. I actually had my phone and my solar panel that I would put outside. So I actually played like a couple of movies on my phone oh, hell yeah. uh, and just, and just, yeah, I just hunkered. I mean, yeah. it was, it was kind of nice. You know, we, we, uh, we stayed warm and, just yeah, and hunkered you're, down. you're out there in nature. So it's like, you know what, you're with yourself and you're not having all these other extra internal stuff like bothering you. So then the last question about this is like, when you said your colleague Bill had to go down, does that mean one of the tour guides has to go down with him? So then it's just, it becomes a lesser group or how would that work? Would he go down by himself? Yeah. Yeah. So, so he went down without one of our, our guides. Cause what they did is they organized a, not a rescue sort of speak that wasn't a, in dire need. Um, but they had someone else who was a former guide. They call them porters. They help bring gear from camp to camp. He came up and then took Bill down to, to base camp. Um, just to give you an idea, there were about 11 Americans with these two groups that were part of the same company. Um, out of the 11, only four people uh, summited, including myself. That's crazy. Not even half. So that, that's got to be... you. I mean, that's a big accomplishment. Obviously, like you want everyone to be there because it's not like a, you're not like racing against each other, but it's hard when you train with people and you go there and you don't see them be there. It's gratifying to know that you were able, you were able to overcome and make that happen. Yeah, I mean, I mean, truthfully, this is also another camp where I shed some tears because, you know, mentally you're, you're, you're kind of at this point where, okay, your, your climbing buddy just, just left you're by yourself and I have to just do this on your own, which, you know, is, is what a lot of people are, are going and climbing mountains for is to, is to have that self-accomplishment, but you know, it's always nice to have a good, a good buddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially like, again, you've had Eli around your whole life. So it's always used to having like something done too. So it's exactly. interesting. So then what, let's talk about the next fellow I got here which looks like it's probably closer to the base of that overall mountain because there's no snow here and there's a, a lake and some rocks behind us and that nice little mountain peak. Yeah. So this was, um, this is a cool, like just rest day at base camp. So above this top over here. Uh, so Aconcagua is behind us. So if you'd made the, made the picture smaller, you could actually see the, the top of Aconcagua. These are, this is actually one of the lagoons from the ice melt. And if you walk this way over in that direction, there's these really cool ice sculptures called penitentes, which is actually specific to the Andes Mountains because of the glacier melt and the way that the sun hits it, I believe, creates these cool, like, you know, stalagmites when yeah. they come up from the ground. It kind of looks like that, but it's actually like just glacier runoff or glacier melt. Interesting. Have these mountains experienced global warming pretty bad? So like we're seeing in the West Coast? Horrible. Um, they were saying that they had these ice sculptures all the way to base camp. And we had to walk like a good 40 minutes, maybe like a mile away, just to get to the, the ice sculptures. And you're not allowed to go over there. I, I actually took my drone and, and flew it over there. So I get a pretty cool shot. Um, but yeah, I mean, the whole mountain is like, if, if you can tell, there's a lot of like scree, which is just like loose rock. Mm -hmm. um, the whole mountain is just deteriorating, mm -hmm. which is, which is kind of sad. That was very tough. Do you know how, what they're doing to try to help prevent that around there? Or is it something that is just out of their control? Yeah, I think it's out of their control. I'm not too sure. So how long did the, from the, the first day you started the hike till you hit the summit of the mountain, how long did that take you? So it was like two weeks exactly. Uh, I looked at the calendar actually before before the podcast just to kind of get an idea because the whole trip was three weeks. 
but we had to have time to get to the hotel, get our COVID test, because you needed to test negative to get into the park, which is actually pretty funny because if you tested positive at any point during your, your stay there, they could take you and use your global rescue, which is a helicopter rescue service, and fly you out of the park, <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty ridiculous to like, have a helicopter pull you out just because of uh, COVID, which makes sense because obviously everyone's at base camp. Um, but yeah, about two weeks. And this was not constant climbing. There were some rest days. So the way that the climbing works is you go from the entrance of the park to a middle kind of base camp. They call it Confluencia, which is about four and a half miles. Then from Confluencia, you do an acclimatization hike, which helps you increase your red blood cells and hemoglobin to absorb the lower oxygen content as you go up. So it's really common in like in expedition climbing um, to, to do these acclimatization hikes. So we went from about 11,000 feet to 13,000 feet and then back down. So you basically climb high, sleep low is the, is the term that you use in, in, in Alpine. Um, and then you rest a day, go to base camp, which is about 11 miles. And then once you get to base camp, now you're going up to these different camps. So we went from base camp to camp one. Uh, camp one had no water. <laughs> so oh, no way. not off to a great start. So what we had to do is we had to carry the stuff that we did not need at base camp, which is like your summit stuff, your down parka, your, your, uh, your warm mittens and whatnot. Drop that at camp one with water. Then we had to go from camp one to camp two, get more water and then bring it down to camp one, then go back to base camp. And then we have a rest day. So it was like a nine hour day going from 14,000 to 17,500. So it was down. almost like a mini, it was almost like a mini summit day. Yeah, it was pretty brutal. Yeah, no, it's almost like, and I guess I, that makes sense for you to rest because if you just did that and you could try to do it again, you need to give your body time to heal. Like I'm sure your calves are sore, your quads, your butt, your glutes, all of it. Yeah, it's pretty, you know, some people want to skip camp one and just go straight to camp two. Um, but you then you run the risk of these high altitude sicknesses like high altitude pulmonary edema, high altitude cerebral edema, which is basically the inflammation and fluid buildup in your brain or in your lungs. And that's what you also see people getting sick from or unfortunately dying from is these things called HAPE or HACE, high altitude pulmonary or high altitude cerebral edema. Crazy. So, so then once you, the whole thing was two weeks. So then you hit the summit at the top of two weeks and then you, how long did it take you to come back down the base? Cause I'm sure, I assume you can't just come straight down because of altitude. You have to like, make sure you come down appropriately to accumulate back correct to some extent so going up is is more more taxing on your body uh going down actually helps any any problem basically like if you have like a stomach ache a headache if you're throwing up whatever the solution is either more oxygen or descending at, in altitude so mm -hmm. because uh, we were supposed to summit on february 4th from camp two and then you go to camp three and then you go to summit. Well, February 4th, the weather was negative 40 degrees oh. <laughs> and 50 mile an hour wind. So that's why we stayed at camp two for so long. We stayed there for five nights. Um, and so actually I, I trained Eli uh, how to read the weather at different altitudes and the wind speeds and the temperature. So I can call him on my satellite phone and say, hey, Eli, what does the weather look like for you know, the 5th, the 6th, the 7th? I want to know what everything looks like. So anyway, so yeah, we had to, we had to stay at camp uh, two for an extra three, three nights. And so we summited on the 6th, which was a 16-hour day. We started at, at 4 a.m. and then got back at 9 a.m. I'm sorry, 10, 9 p.m. Wild. Went to sleep, woke up, and then descended from camp three so we just came down 3,000 feet from the summit we woke up that next morning and then descended another 5,000 feet how long did you stay at the summit for it was like 30 minutes or so which, which is interesting to think about like you have this huge accomplishment of getting to the summit you you reach the peak but you really don't stay there that long for the amount of effort <laughs> yeah. and time you're it's not that big of a thing so is that something that's kind of like weird to think about 
It is. So I knew that was going to happen. Um, so, you know, with the training and with all the gear researching and whatnot, uh, a big portion of me just training was watching all these different videos, like 14 Peaks, The Alpinist, Meru, In the Thin Air, Beyond the Limit, Everest, like all the different climbing videos. And all of them, you only have 20 to 30 minutes and you got to get down because, you know, you, you only made it halfway. The other halfway is getting down from the summit back to base camp safely. And 80% of accidents actually happen on the way down. Um, so I had this like checklist in my mind. I was like, okay, I got to take a picture. I got to hold my flag that I brought. I got to take a, like a selfie and a video and then I'm off. And so that combined with crying went pretty, pretty quick. Cause I was just, you know, so exhausted. Um, yeah. Mentally, physically. Just wanted to, yeah. I wanted to get off there pretty quick. What's the flag? Cause in the, this picture here, we can't see it, but I see it in your hand. Yeah. Yeah. So the flag, it says uh, port 53 technologies, which is the company that I work for uh, February, 2022 summit, 23,000 feet. Heck yeah. I love that. And you left it at the, on top of the summit. <laughs> Hell no, I brought that down. <laughs> so, yeah, no, that flag's going with you. Every mountain you go to, you keep getting more and more flags. Yep, exactly. That's awesome. And then we got one more photo to share for the audience out there. Again, please go to the YouTube channel, Leap of Fate. to see what we got talking about. And this might be a person, my favorite photo is just, it's like red mountains, red clouds. And it has, this has to be probably like a sunset type of photo. And just the way the light's hitting the Andres here, it's just so beautiful. Yeah, this is at base camp. Uh, I think probably the first or second night. And this is simply just the sunset. No filter, just beautiful. Um, and we got to experience this almost every single night. Which is wild. And how many people are at base camp at one time? There were a good amount. Um, I mean, because they're cycling in and out, I'd say probably a good like 400 people. So uh, is there only a certain time of year you're able to summit at the top? Like it's only like January, February, March. Other than that, the weather's not good enough or are people able to climb year round? Yeah, so so this one specifically, I was actually scheduled to climb this at the end of December uh, over Christmas. But because of COVID, they shortened the window on how many days they're open. So usually it's 90 days that they're open. This season, they were only open for 45 days on when you can start the summit. And then you can obviously expend more time because it takes about two weeks to climb post-summit. So I think it was this year, it was, it was January and February, and that was about it. And then, you know, they cleaned up the whole, the whole camp in March. But yeah, we're climbing during the summer. So in yeah. Mendoza, when we got to the hotel, it was like 85. Super yeah. nice. Yeah, so like the, t the peak, negative 40, but the base of the mountain, 80 degrees and sunny and beautiful. Yep. So it's interesting. So then now that you've been able to finish it, get home, reflect, what are some of the biggest thoughts that you have as you look back at your time and like, I made that happen and I did it? Yeah, I mean, uh, understanding that I haven't really done a lot of high altitude climbing like the highest point was, you know, in Tahoe, probably like 9,000 feet. Um, and having a train at sea level, it really kind of puts it in my mind that anything is possible. And of course, I've been, I've been reading um, the guy who did 14 Peaks. His name is Nims Dai. He, he had a book called Beyond Possible. Um, but really, if you put your mind to anything, you can, you can accomplish whatever you want. It's just a matter of the preparation and the training beforehand. I agree with that. And then for people that you were speaking to when you told them your type of training and you're doing stuff at sea level and just climbing stairs in the apartment <laughs> building, were they kind of impressed like as a newbie, fair enough, in the mountaineer game, what you were able to accomplish for your first true summit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there were there were some supporters and there were some non-supporters. Um, just <laughs> based off out there? Of, based, oh, of course. I mean, uh, there's always going to be some. Um, but just based off of what I what I was able to do and what I've what I've done in the past there were some people thinking that I wasn't going to be able to make it because I mean it's 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 a it's a you know it's it's high up it's 23,000 feet and like when you told your parents hey I want to do this obviously you're your own person but what was your family and close uh, people around you think about okay like we're going to support Nate but like do we want to support Nate in this endeavor 
Yeah, they, they were a little bit on the fence. You know, they were supportive, of course. I mean, that's just how my family is. Um, but there's that level of risk. So I had to kind of ease them into the fact that it's not Everest. It's not super technical climbing with like an ice axe on like a vertical waterfall, like some of these places like Annapurna mm-hmm. or Everest. Um, but the mountain is called the, the, the mountain of death. So that didn't help out when they, when they researched it on Google, if you research it on Google or Wikipedia, it's like not, it's not very family friendly, I should say. So we obviously just talked about the summit and now you, you climb back down. So you got back to base camp. Uh, anything happened to you? Like, did your body kind of break down from all that? You were just super exhausted mentally, physically, things like that. So I was, I was pretty lucky. Um, the only thing that happened was my, my toenails, uh, both of my big toenails were pushing up against my, my double boot. So they were, they're long gone. Um, I have that from my half marathon training too. This like I'm blisters, toenails gone. I'm like, shit, here we go. Yeah. So bad. Uh, But the nice thing was, so there's two options when you get down to base camp. Option number one is you walk out the same way you came in, which goes from 14,000 feet down to 7,500. Um, or sorry, 14,000 down to 8,000. So 6,000 more feet after 8,000 feet of coming down. Uh, But the difference is you had to walk 14 miles out. Wild. (laughs) The the other option was you take a helicopter. (laughs) (laughs) And you're just like, yeah, I'm gonna go go first roll with it and just get a helicopter out. Oh yeah, I went Top Gun style. I'm like, you know what? I am out of here. And so us three, so three people out of our group, three out of the five made it to the summit. We all split the helicopter ride and got out of there as quickly as possible. I guess, that's actually yeah, it, a, a good question. So how much did this whole experience uh, cost? Obviously, like maybe we break it up in two. How much did the cost you to have to buy all the equipment, you know, clothes, everything, et cetera, to have? And then how much did it actually cost to then um, pay to be part of this experience to summit the mountain? Yeah, I'd say the, uh, the 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 guided the guided company um, that we used was was really good. Um, so with the permit and their uh, service, it was probably five thousand. Okay, is how's that um, is that cheap, com- medium, expensive compared to like other climbs? Yeah, Everest is like between like sixty and a hundred thousand. No um, way. No, yeah, it's no super idea. expensive. Well, you're there for two months because you're 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 having to acclimatize so much. Mm. um denali is like i think 17 to twenty thousand. um and then another company that we were were kind of climbing with dude they were charging like eight thousand dollars and they've never climbed aconcagua they've summited like denali and they've done mount rainier but they've never summited aconcagua and they were charging like almost double that wow. i was paying and, and out of their group, one person out of five made it, or one person out of six made it. <laughs> Sounds like you got the better group for sure. <laughs> oh yeah, Wild. for sure, for sure. So, so yeah, with with all the gear, all the gear too was was pretty expensive. I mean, the, the boots alone are are you know upwards of a thousand dollars or close to it. And a lot um, of that obviously is like a fixed cost. Like once you have it, yeah, maybe you need to replace something here and there, but you can obviously reuse it for most mountains, correct? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, that's where I'm going to use it for for a lot of different backpacking trips. But I figured, like, if I have a lot of confidence in my gear, and I've done my training, I just gotta, I gotta be there and just do it. Now that you are done with it, you can look back at it. What do you want to look forward to? What, what do you have any more mountains you want to climb? Do you have any other peaks that you're trying to go for? This last week, uh, absolutely nothing went through my mind on, on what I wanted to train for. I, I really abused uh, DoorDash. Like I, I, I wanted to just sit on my couch and just have food get delivered to me. Well, I was <laughs> and that, you're in New York, you can't get in and out, it sucks. <laughs> the first yeah. thing you would have got back in California. <laughs> that, was, that was the first thing that I would have gotten, yeah. Um, but no, not, now that I'm looking forward, I, I definitely want to continue, um, you know, ba- like backpacking, um, you know, getting really into rock climbing. And then I think the next on the list is going to be Kilimanjaro. And do they give you a time frame? Hey, you did this mountain, you should wait X amount of months to go to New Mountain, or is it kind of just on your own time when you feel ready to go do it? 
I think it's based on the season and when you're ready. But yeah, a lot of people actually do Aconcagua to train for Denali in Alaska because you're carrying a lot of your own gear. Mm. So when do you think you would try to go for a Kilimanjaro? Uh, I'd say probably 2023 or 2024 in the next in the next year or two for sure. Got it. And this, of course, is February 2022 when this happens. So it gives you a year. Now, obviously, uh, come back to California first before you go do that. <laughs> yeah, I'll come back to sea level and get some surfing in before I go up to the, yeah. the mountains again. <laughs> yeah, then from my perspective, Nate, I think as one of like your best friends, it's so impressive to see what you accomplished. And like you had a dream and you made it happen, like take out the podcast, just supporting you in this endeavor and seeing you. And obviously for the two weeks, like I really had no communication with you. So like <laughs> in the back of your head, you're like, how's he doing? Is he able to accomplish it? And then you see on social media, hey, I made it. Y'all look at my picture. Like the feeling I had out of love and, and seeing the victory for you. And I know all of us are speaking for all our friend group. I'm just so proud of you. And it's amazing to see what you're able to accomplish and how uh, it affected your life for the better in terms of like the practice, the preparation accomplishing your goals and just seeing it almost like a new leaf turn for you and like what you feel like you can accomplish moving forward no i appreciate that thank you yeah and that's what we try to talk about here on leap of fate is exactly what i just said the name is like it may not be easy it may be tough you may see strife in the load you may have to go up and back down up and back down but if you keep the right head and to keep the right mindset you will be able to overcome and you can summit whatever that is if that's a mountain if that's whatever you're trying to accomplish and your goals, overcoming drugs, whatever you need to do, you can summit that and you can make it your own and you can continue forward and live the best life that you want to live. Life is like mountain climbing, Randy. There's a lot of ups and downs. A lot of ups and downs, but hopefully you make it back down and you don't have to <laughs> stay up there. But, Nate, any last words for the audience today? No, that's it. That was amazing. I appreciate it, Randy. Awesome. Nate, thank you so much for coming on. Again, this is the Leap of Faith podcast. If you're interested in mountaineering, you want to hear more about Nate's story, anything like that, Nate, how can people find you? Uh, yeah, they can They can find me through through you or on my social media. Uh, very heavily involved on Instagram. So you can find me there. Awesome. And he has a lot of cool videos he posts. He said he's got drone videos, he's got pictures there. All his information will be in the bio. Of course, if you're uh, listening and watching, Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube. Thank you so much. Please do rate, like, subscribe to this podcast to help me grow the message. Share stories like Nate for the world. Nate, thank you so much for coming on today. We'll get a go ahead and do our sign off. So we're good after me. Stay healthy. Stay healthy. Stay wealthy. Stay wealthy. And have a good week, man. Have a good week. Man. Go summit your personal challenges and make it happen. Woo! Deuces. <laughs>